Chapter sixty five of Barnaby Rudge. The Slibrivox recording is in the public domain. Barnaby Rudge by Charles Dickens. Chapter sixty five. During the whole course of the terrible scene which was now at its height, one man in the jail suffered a degree of fear and mental torment which had no parallel in the endurance even of those who lay under sentence of death. When the rioters first assembled before the building, the murderer was roused from sleep, if such slumbers as his may have that blessed name, by the roar of voices and the struggling of a great crowd. He started up as these sounds met his ear, and sitting on his bedstead listened. After a short interval of silence the noise burst out again. Still listening attentively, he made out, in course of time, that the jail was besieged by a furious multitude. His guilty conscience instantly arrayed these men against himself, and brought the fear upon him that he would be singled out and torn to pieces. Once impressed with the terror of this conceit, everything tended to confirm and strengthen it. His double crime, the circumstances under which it had been committed, the length of time that had elapsed, and its discovery in spite of all, made him, as it were, the visible object of the Almighty's wrath. In all the crime and vice and moral gloom of the great pest-house of the capital, he stood alone, marked and singled out by his great guilt, a Lucifer among the devils. The other prisoners were a host, hiding and sheltering each other, a crowd like that without the walls. He was one man against the whole united concourse, a single solitary lonely man from whom the very captives in the jail fell off and shrunk appalled it might be that the intelligence of his capture having been brooded abroad they had come there purposely to drag him out and kill him in the street or it might be that they were the rioters and in pursuance of an old design had come to sack the prison but in either case he had no belief or hope that they would spare him every shout they raised and every sound they made was a blow upon his heart as the attack went on, he grew more wild and frantic in his terror, tried to pull away the bars that guarded the chimney and prevented him from climbing up, called loudly on the turnkeys to cluster round the cell and save him from the fury of the rabble, or put him in some dungeon underground, no matter of what depth, how dark it was, or loathsome, or beset with rats and creeping things, so that it hid him and was hard to find. But no one came or answered him. Fearful, even while he cried to them, of attracting attention, he was silent. By and by he saw, as he looked from his grated window, a strange glimmering on the stone walls and pavement of the yard. It was feeble at first, and came and went, as though some officers with torches were passing to and fro upon the roof of the prison. Soon it reddened, and lighted brands came whirling down, spattering the ground with fire, and burning sullenly in corners. One rolled beneath a wooden bench, and set it in a blaze. Another caught a water-spout, and so went climbing up the wall, leaving a long straight track of fire behind it. After a time a slow thick shower of burning fragments from some upper portion of the prison which was blazing nigh began to fall before his door. Remembering that it opened outwards, he knew that every spark which fell upon the heap and in the act lost its bright life and died an ugly speck of dust and rubbish helped to entomb him in a living grave still though the jail resounded with shrieks and cries for help though the fire bounded up as if each separate flame had had a tiger's life and roared as though in every one there were a hungry voice though the heat began to grow intense and the air suffocating and the clamour without increased and the danger of his situation even from one merciless element, was every moment more extreme. Still he was afraid to raise his voice again, lest the crowd should break in, and should, of their own ears, or from the information given them by the other prisoners, get the clue to his place of confinement. Thus fearful alike of those within the prison, and of those without, of noise and silence, light and darkness, of being released and being left there to die, he was so tortured and tormented, that nothing man has ever done to man in the horrible caprice of power and cruelty exceeds his self-inflicted punishment. Now, now the door was down. Now they came rushing through the jail, calling to each other in the vaulted passages, clashing the iron gates dividing yard from yard, beating at the doors of cells and wards, wrenching off bolts and locks and bars, tearing down the doorposts to get men out, endeavouring to drag them by main force through gaps and windows where a child could scarcely pass, 
whooping and yelling without a moment's rest, and running through the heat and flames as if they were cased in metal. By their legs, their arms, the hair upon their heads, they dragged the prisoners out. Some threw themselves upon the captives as they got towards the door, and tried to file away their irons. Some danced about them with a frenzied joy, and rent their clothes, and were ready, as it seemed, to tear them limb from limb. Now a party of a dozen men came darting through the yard, into which the murderer cast fearful glances from his darkened window. Dragging a prisoner along the ground, whose dress they had nearly torn from his body in their mad eagerness to set him free, and who was bleeding and senseless in their hands. Now a score of prisoners ran to and fro, who had lost themselves in the intricacies of the prison, and were so bewildered with the noise and glare that they knew not where to turn or what to do, and still cried out for help as loudly as before. Anon, some famished wretch, whose theft had been a loaf of bread or a scrap of butcher's meat, came skulking past, barefooted, going slowly away because that jail, his house, was burning, not because he had any other, or had friends to meet, or old haunts to revisit, or any liberty to gain, but liberty to starve and die. And then a knot of highwaymen went trooping by, conducted by the friends they had among the crowd, who muffled their fetters as they went along, with handkerchiefs and bands of hay, and wrapped them in coats and cloaks, and gave them drink from bottles, and held it to their lips because of their handcuffs, which there was no time to remove. All this, and heaven knows how much more, was done amidst a noise, a hurry, and distraction, like nothing that we know of, even in our dreams, which seemed for ever on the rise, and never to decrease for the space of a single instant. He was still looking down from his window upon these things, when a band of men with torches, ladders, axes, and many kinds of weapons poured into the yard, and hammering at his door, inquired if there were any prisoner within. He left the window when he saw them coming, and drew back into the remotest corner of the cell. But although he returned them no answer, they had a fancy that someone was inside, for they presently set ladders against it, and began to tear away the bars at the casement. Not only that, indeed, but with pickaxes to hew down the very stones in the wall. As soon as they had made a breach at the window, large enough for the admission of a man's head, one of them thrust in a torch and looked all round the room. He followed this man's gaze until it rested on himself, and heard him demand why he had not answered, but made him no reply. In the general surprise and wonder they were used to this. Without saying anything more, they enlarged the breach until it was large enough to admit the body of a man, and then came dropping down upon the floor, one after another, until the cell was full. They caught him up among them, handed him to the window, and those who stood upon the ladders passed him down upon the pavement of the yard. Then the rest came out, one after another, and bidding him fly and lose no time, or the way would be choked up, hurried away to rescue others. It seemed not a minute's work from first to last. He staggered to his feet, incredulous of what had happened, when the yard was filled again and a crowd rushed on, hurrying Barnaby among them. In another minute, not so much. Another minute, the same instant, with no lapse or interval between. He and his son were being passed from hand to hand through the dense crowd in the street, and were glancing backward at a burning pile which some one said was Newgate. From the moment of their first entrance into the prison, the crowd dispersed themselves about it, and swarmed into every chink and crevice, as if they had a perfect acquaintance with its innermost parts, and bore in their minds an exact plan of the whole. For this immediate knowledge of the place they were, no doubt, in a great degree indebted to the hangmen, who stood in the lobby directing some to go this way, some that, and some the other, and who materially assisted in bringing about the wonderful rapidity with which the release of the prisoners was effected. But this functionary of the law reserved one important piece of intelligence, and kept it snugly to himself. When he had issued his instructions relative to every other part of the building, and the mob were dispersed from end to end and busy at their work, he took a bundle of keys from a kind of cupboard in the wall, and going by a kind of passage near the chapel, it joined the governor's house and was then on fire, he took himself to the condemned cells, which were a series of small, strong, dismal rooms, opening on a low gallery, guarded at the end at which he entered by a strong iron wicket, and at its opposite extremity by two doors and a thick grate. Having double-locked the wicket, and assured himself that the other entrances were well secured, he sat down on a bench in the gallery, and sucked the head of his stick with the utmost complacency, tranquillity, and contentment. 
It would have been strange enough, a man's enjoying himself in this quiet manner, while the prison was burning and such a tumult was cleaving the air, though he had been outside the walls. But here, in the very heart of the building, and moreover with the prayers and cries of the four men under sentence sounding in his ears, and their hands stretched out through the gratings and their cell doors, clasped in frantic entreaty before his very eyes, it was particularly remarkable. Indeed, Mr. Dennis appeared to think it an uncommon circumstance, and to banter himself upon it, for he thrust his hat on one side, as some men do when they are in a waggish humour, sucked the head of his stick with a higher relish, and smiled as though he would say, "'Dennis, you're a rum dog. You're a queer fellow. You're a capital company, Dennis, and quite a character.' He sat in this way for some minutes, while the four men in the cells, who were certain that somebody had entered the gallery but could not see who, gave vent to such piteous entreaties as wretches in their miserable condition may be supposed to have been inspired with, urging whoever it was to set them at liberty for the love of heaven, and protesting with great fervour, and truly enough, perhaps, for the time, that if they escaped they would amend their ways, and would never, never, never again do wrong before God or man, but would lead penitent and sober lives, and sorrowfully repent the crimes they had committed." The terrible energy with which they spoke would have moved any person, no matter how good or just, if any good or just person could have strayed into that sad place that night, to have set them at liberty, and while he would have left any other punishment to its free course, to have saved them from this last dreadful and repulsive penalty, which never turned a man inclined to evil, and has hardened thousands who were half inclined to good. Mr. Dennis, who had been bred and nurtured in the good old school, and had administered the good old laws on the good old plan, always once and sometimes twice every six weeks for a long time, bore these appeals with a deal of philosophy. Being at last, however, rather disturbed in his pleasant reflection by their repetition, he rapped at one of the doors with his stick and cried, "'Hold your noise there, will you?' At this they all cried together that they were to be hanged on the next day but one, and again implored his aid. "'Aid for what?' said Mr. Dennis, playfully wrapping the knuckles of the hand nearest him. "'To save us!' they cried. "'Oh, certainly,' said Mr. Dennis, winking at the wall, in the absence of any friend with whom he could humour the joke. "'And so you're to be worked off, are you, brothers?' "'Unless we are released to-night,' one of them cried, "'we are dead men.' "'I tell you what it is,' said the hangman gravely. "'I'm afraid, my friend, that you're not in that air state of mind that's suitable to your condition, then.' "'You're not a-going to be released. Don't think it. "'Will you leave off that air indecent row? "'I wonder you ain't ashamed of yourselves. I do.' "'He followed up this reproof by wrapping every set of knuckles, "'one after the other, and having done so, "'resumed his seat again with a cheerful countenance. "'You've had law,' he said, crossing his legs and elevating his eyebrows. "'Laws have been made a purpose for you. "'A wary handsome prison's been made a purpose for you. "'A parson's kept a purpose for you.' A constitutional officer's appointed a purpose for you. Carts has maintained a purpose for you. And yet you're not contented. Will you hold that noise, you, sir, in the furthest? A groan was the only answer. So well as I can make out, said Mr. Dennis, in a tone of mingled badinage and remonstrance, there's not a man among you. I begin to think I'm on the opposite side and among the ladies, though for the matter of that I've seen a many ladies face it out in a manner that did honour to the sex. "'You and number two, don't grind them teeth of yours. "'Worst manners,' said the hangman, rapping at the door with his stick. "'I never see in this place afore. "'I'm ashamed of you. You're a disgrace to the bailey.' "'After pausing for a moment to hear if anything could be pleaded in justification, "'Mr. Dennis resumed, in a sort of coaxing tone. "'Now look ye here, you four. "'I'm come here to take care of you and see that you ain't burnt, instead of the other thing.' "'It's no use your making any noise, for you won't be found out by them as has broken in, "'and you'll only be hoarse when you come to the speeches, which is a pity. "'What I say in respect to the speeches always is, give it mouth. "'That's my maxim, give it mouth. "'I've heard,' said the hangman, pulling off his hat to take his handkerchief from the crown and wipe his face, "'and then putting it on again a little more on one side than before. "'I've heard a eloquence on them boards. "'You know what boards I mean.' and have heard a degree of mouth given to them speeches, that they was as clear as a bell and as good as a play. There's a pattern. And always, when a thing of this nature's to come off, what I stand up for is a proper frame of mind. Let's have a proper frame of mind, and we can go through with it creditable. 
pleasant, sociable. Whatever you do, and I address myself in particular to you in the furthest, never snivel. I'd sooner by half, though I lose by it, see a man tear his clothes a purpose to spile em before they come to me, than find him snivelling. It's ten to one a better frame of mind every way. While the hangman addressed them to this effect, in the tone and with the air of a pastor in familiar conversation with his flock, the noise had been in some degree subdued, for the rioters were busy in conveying the prisoners to the sessions house, which was beyond the main walls of the prison, though connected with it, and the crowd were busy, too, in passing them from thence along the street. But when he had got thus far in his discourse, the sound of voices in the yard showed plainly that the mob had returned and were coming that way, and directly afterwards a violent crashing at the grate below gave note of their attack upon the cells, as they were called, at last. It was in vain the hangman ran from door to door and covered the grates, one after another, with his hat, in futile efforts to stifle the cries of the four men within. It was in vain he dogged their outstretched hands and beat them with his stick, or menaced them with new and lingering pains in the execution of his office. The place resounded with their cries. These, together with the feeling that they were now the last men in the jail, so worked upon and stimulated the besiegers, that in an incredibly short space of time they forced the strong grate down below, which was formed of iron rods two inches square, drove in the two other doors, as if they had been but deal partitions, and stood at the end of the gallery with only a bar or two between them and the cells. "Halloa!" cried Hugh, who was the first to look into the dusky passage. "'Dennis before us! Well done, old boy! Be quick and open here, for we shall be suffocated in the smoke going out.' "'Go out at once, then,' said Dennis. "'What do you want here?' want echoed hugh the four men four devils cried the hangman don't you know they're left for death on thursday don't you respect the law the constitution nothing let the four men be is this a time for joking cried hugh do you hear em pull away these bars that have got fixed between the door and the ground and let us in brother said the hangman in a low voice as he stooped under pretence of doing what hugh desired but only looked up in his face "'Can't you leave these here four men to me, if I've the whim? "'You do what you like, and have what you like of everything for your share. "'Give me my share. "'I want these four men left alone, I tell you. "'Pull the bars down, or stand out of the way,' was Hugh's reply. "'You can turn the crowd if you like. "'You know that well enough, brother,' said the hangman slowly. "'What? "'You will come in, will you?' "'Yes. "'You won't let these men alone and leave them to me?' "'You've no respect for nothing, haven't you?' said the hangman, retreating to the door by which he had entered, and regarding his companion with a scowl. "'You will come in, will you, brother?' "'I tell you, yes. What the devil ails you? Where are you going?' "'No matter where I'm going,' rejoined the hangman, looking in again at the iron wicket which he had nearly shut upon himself and held ajar. "'Remember where you're coming, that's all.' With that he shook his likeness at Hugh, and, giving him a grin, compared with which his usual smile was amiable, disappeared and shut the door. Hugh paused no longer, but goaded alike by the cries of the convicts and by the impatience of the crowd, warned the man immediately behind him, the way was only wide enough for one abreast, to stand back and wielded a sledge-hammer with such strength that after a few blows the iron bent and broke and gave them free admittance. If the two sons of one of these men, of whom mention has been made, were furious in their zeal before, they had now the wrath and vigour of lions. Calling to the man within each cell to keep as far back as he could, lest the axes crashing through the door should wound him, a party went to work upon each one, to beat it in by sheer strength, and force the bolts and staples from their hold. But although these two lads had the weakest party and the worst armed, and did not begin until after the others, having stopped to whisper to him through the grate, that door was the first open, and that man was the first out. As they dragged him into the gallery to knock off his irons, he fell down among them, a mere heap of chains, and was carried out in that state on men's shoulders with no sign of life. The release of these four wretched creatures, and conveying them astounded and bewildered into the streets so full of life, a spectacle they had never thought to see again, until they emerged from solitude and silence upon that last journey, when the air should be heavy with the pent-up breath of thousands, and the streets and houses should be built and roofed with human faces, not with bricks and tiles and stones, was the crowning horror of the scene. 
their pale and haggard looks and hollow eyes, their staggering feet and hands stretched out as if to save themselves from falling, their wandering and uncertain air, the way they heaved and gasped for breath as though in water, when they were first plunged into the crowd, all marked them for the men. No need to say, this one was doomed to die, for there were the words broadly stamped and branded on his face. The crowd fell off as if they had been laid out for burial, and had risen in their shrouds, and many were seen to shudder as though they had been actually dead men when they chanced to touch a brush against their garments. At the bidding of the mob, the houses were all illuminated that night, lighted up from top to bottom, as at a time of public gaiety and joy. Many years afterwards, old people who lived in their youth near this part of the city, remembered being in a great glare of light, with indoors and without, and as they looked, timid and frightened children from the windows, seeing a face go by. Though the whole great crowd, and all its other terrors, had faded from their recollection, this one object remained, alone, distinct, and well remembered. Even in the unpractised minds of infants, one of these doomed men, darting past, and but an instant seen, was an image of force enough to dim the whole concourse, to find itself an all-absorbing place, and hold it ever after. When this last task had been achieved, the shouts and cries grew fainter. The clank of fetters, which had resounded on all sides as the prisoners escaped, was heard no more. All the noises of the crowd subsided into a hoarse and sullen murmur as it passed into the distance, and when the human tide had rolled away, a melancholy heap of smoking ruins marked the spot where it had lately chafed and roared. End of chapter 65